over the last 15 years that led to the research for exponential theory, this theory that um, once someone becomes exponential or moves away from a linear path where everything's chronological and you start thinking bigger, um, that you actually become more conscious and you, you start to solve problems for more people. And obviously you start to think bigger and that applies to every startup that I work with, um, every venture back company, as well as these global 100 companies is really, you know, really reprogramming and relearning this uh, skill of, you know, how do you think about your day? How do you think about what you're doing? What are the activities that you're putting your mind to? Um, because once you start to think bigger about those, uh, you'll start to see bigger results as long as you have a longer term strategy for that. All right, everybody, welcome to a brand new episode of the None of Your Business podcast. We're super excited to be with you once again today. You've got Sean and Lacey here. And as usual, we have an incredible guest that we're going to be diving deep with. This one is going to be a, a deep conversation, I can tell already, um, because there are so many things. Who doesn't want exponential fill in the blank, exponential growth, exponential revenue, exponential marketing, exponential, exponential leads, ex everything. <laughs> and this is the guy on all things exponential. You know, I love this idea of compounding interest, right? You know, our mentors have taught us the concept of not only compounding interest, relative to finances, but compounding effective action. Mm -hmm. Talk an awful lot about that, how just every single day, if we can do a little bit more. But I love this idea because we get the compounding effect and then the results are exponential, right? We start to get these exponential results and who doesn't want exponential results in all of these areas? Our guest today um, is an expert. Now, if you've heard me speak, you know, so many times I've talked about, and especially when it comes to marketing, it is a good idea sometimes to just wake up and declare yourself an expert. Right. <laughs> so, and especially we when know there's people that have done that. Too. Right. And especially yeah. if there, if it's a it's a topic area that there's really no expertise in, you know. So let's say like COVID came out. Well, you just show up and you're like, I'm an expert in COVID. And you start doing media and you start sharing an opinion. Well, there was no expert in COVID before there was COVID. And then all of a sudden, bam, there was COVID. And then you needed experts. And it's that way on a lot of things. But this guy is not like that. This is not the case. This is not this. This is a person who has been around the track more than one time, has an incredible track record and has done this, has applied his concepts multiple times in multiple areas and multiple businesses. I know that you are all going to gain an awful lot from today's podcast. Let's welcome in Aaron Bear. He is the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of Exponential Theory. You guys got to go get the book right away. Most of the time, Aaron, people give all the stuff at the end. I want people to jump on this. I want them to get the book. Um, I want them to plug in with you, Aaron Bear, A-A-R-O-N-B-A-R-E.com. And then they can access all your stuff. Um, and that way, as we're already creating the access, we can have the conversation. Welcome to the None of Your Business podcast. Hey, good to be here, Sean and Lacey. Uh, been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, so. We always start with the same question. If you've heard our podcast before, um, I have a feeling that your answer to this is going to be pretty dang interesting. A lot of people are like, look, um, you bring on all these people. Obviously, we bring on successful people on the podcast. Maybe we should try bringing somebody who's just like, I'm not that successful. <laughs> so we could talk about it. That might be interesting. Right. But we bring on successful people. But oftentimes, you know, in the podcast world, in the media world, people see people on podcasts or on television or on different shows. And it's easy for us to think, well, Aaron, that's because you're so lucky. That's because you're so fortunate. That's because you're your so father, gifted. Everybody your father was, was already an entrepreneur and taught you everything by the time you were six. And that is usually not the case. Can you tell us how we end up here? I mean, your track record's incredible. How do you amass all of this? What were some of the bumps and bruises that you took along that way? 
Well, um, it, it didn't all it didn't all start exponential. We'll put it that way. I grew up in um, Fort Wayne, Indiana, in a midwestern town. had had really uh, beliefs that's that where uh, that's where I grew up. Holy no smokes! Yeah, all right, well. how about well, that? I grew up in the south side of town. I went to Wayne High School, if that means anything to you. But um, yeah. well, I went to the I went to the twin of Wayne High School, which is North, oh, North High School. Up. Yeah, yes. you had an extra you had extra wing, but you had the same exact uh, school. Yeah, it was, yes. that's funny. Well, um, but from there, obviously, coming you know, Fort Wayne had uh, that midwestern you know, and I hadn't really known the world very well, um, being outside of Indiana much or traveling a lot, and. Um, in, I got the opportunity to go on this trip called Semester at Sea that uh, allowed me to really circumnavigate the world where I literally threw out a, flew out of Fort Wayne first time really on a flight by myself out of the country to the Bahamas. I ended up going to Venezuela, Brazil, South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, India, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Taiwan, China, Japan, and then back to Seattle. So that accelerated learning adventure um, one gave me a great point of view and perspective of the world that, you know, we're not all so different. And uh, the media definitely has a, an opinion of how they um, share things in the world to, to pique your interest. Um, but, you know, with that, coming back to the U.S., uh, really um, diving in and saying I wanted a career that was international. I wanted to, you know, continue to have that uh, those dopamine rushes of traveling and learning and learning and curiosity became one of my my driving mo intrinsic motivating factors that I had. And that ultimately led to, to a career in uh, innovation facilitating where I uh, worked with companies like Daimler, Mercedes-Benz, better known as Mercedes-Benz, uh, Coca-Cola, Belfius Bank, which is the National Bank of Belgium. And I would take these companies in and out of different ecosystems around the world, like Tel Aviv and Shanghai and Singapore, London, Copenhagen, New York, Sil Silicon Valley. And we would visit all these exponential companies that would teach them really, you know, what they were doing that was different and what they were doing that was at an accelerated pace to what they were doing. You know, they were number one, you know, we'll take um, Mercedes Benz as an example. They were number one in a lot of different things, but what they learned quickly on these learning expeditions that I facilitated is that they were never, they're not number one in any one thing anymore, is that there was always a, you know, someone in a garage somewhere that had invented something that was actually a better product for whatever it was. And they were growing at an exponential pace. And over time, that exponential pace would take over the world. So over the last 15 years, that led to the research for exponential theory, this theory that um, once someone becomes exponential or moves away from a linear path where everything's chronological and you start thinking bigger, um, that you actually become more conscious and you, you start to solve problems for more people. And obviously, you start to think bigger and that applies to every startup that I work with, um, every venture back company, as well as these global 100 companies is really, you know, really reprogramming and relearning this uh, skill of, you know, how do you think about your day? How do you think about what you're doing? What are the activities that you're putting your mind to? Um, because once you start to think bigger about those, uh, you'll start to see bigger results as long as you have a longer term strategy for that. And I think that's part of the rub here in modern day society is uh, we have, you know, this constant instant gratification that, that we all want. And, you know, attention engineers have really wired, rewired our brain to kind of be starved for it where exponential thinkers realize that, you know, it takes 10 years or longer to kind of create these massive transformative purposes. And so that's, that's my goal in life now is to help, you know, individuals uh, coach them and their companies to think exponentially. And I think that that's how I can make the biggest impact on the world is this 15 years of traveling around and literally going out of 90 countries, all 50 states, over 500 different companies, every, you know, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, all those companies I've visited and spent time with their executives and kind of learned their processes, their, their, their growth mindset. But I, I literally challenge growth mindset to create an exponential mindset, which is part of what I do uh, when I work with people, but it, it really does start from the one person that has an idea. If you, you think bigger about it and you may not be able to think bigger at a, at first, but you have to have someone, a mentor, a coach, or someone around you to challenge you to think bigger about that. And that's what I really see my role in the world today is to, to help people do that. It's really interesting. Cause I'm listening to you talk and thinking about 
so many of the entrepreneurs that we personally work with that are really good at starting a lot of things. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs identify with this, well, I have tons of ideas, right? They're idea generators. They start things, they get bored and they move on. But what I'm hearing you talk about is this idea of exponential thinking is it's a long-term approach. It requires some longevity. And the most successful people on the planet, the most successful companies on the planet actually apply this into their businesses. So what would advice would you give that entrepreneur that's like, well, I just have ideas and I just start them and I move to the next thing. How do we manage that? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you a story to, to kind of help kind of uh, all your listeners out there kind of wrap your heads around it is I myself have sold 12 companies. It sounds really impressive. I've failed it dozens more, if, if that makes any sense. I've had a lot more failure than I've had success. So ideas are a dime a dozen. And the reality of uh, Bill Gates has a famous quote, which I, I kind of start the book off as he's one of the first exponential thinkers. But here's a quote is we often overestimate what we can do in one year and underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that really is the difference between, you know, what I'll just say an entrepreneur that wants to make a living and one ideas. I did that over and over again. And I would sell a company literally, you know, for my own ego or whatever it was before it ever got started. So this is all learned the hard way. <laughs> this mm -hmm. wasn't the easy, I didn't take the easy route to, to say, hey, you just got to think big out of the box. I think everyone has to learn that process. And there are honestly every failed product, and I, I talk about this in the book a lot, um, is, is something that whether it's a failed startup is really just getting you ready for the next opportunity. And I think that's something we need to reprogram and relearn. Angel investors is 80% of investments are going to fail. And we need to get people to think a little bit longer term than this instant gratification, because there's a lot of good ideas that just take a long term. And I, I invented a term in the book called Mars shots. And I'm sure you've heard of Google moon shots where uh, Google is this, you know, think tank that they really say, let's create some moon shots. So Elon Musk being the big thinker, he really created a Mars shot with SpaceX. So he just said, I'm going to put and civilize, you know, 40,000 or 80,000 people on Mars by 2040. Now, if he fails at doing that, he's already succeeded at becoming the largest private space company. He's shuttling people back and forth from the International Space Station. He's created a reusable ro rocket, you know, managing his quite unique MVP of creating a minimal viable product. He's done some incredible things with this company to really, you know, and he, he honestly, is, if there was a mascot for the book, it would be Elon Musk because he's done this leveraging exponential technologies, longer, leveraging long-term thinking, you know, Tesla itself. Uh, was a blog post in 2006 that predicted that he'd be where he is today, you know, based on succeeding in small steps. I'm going to create a Roadster, which is a very high-end product that will allow me to pay for building the Model S. The Model S is going to be an overpriced luxury car that then I can build, eventually build the Model 3, which now, you know, literally every corner you drive around, there's a Model 3 or a Starbucks. So um, you see that exponential thinking at work is knowing that there are stages to that. And that's part of helping these small entrepreneurs think bigger about their ideas. They have to get to the first stage first. And oftentimes I, I use a, a model in the book that I talk about that um, is you got to create a repeatable business model. And then at a certain point that repeatability becomes predictable. And then you start, you know, then you start getting sales and marketing and metrics around how do you create the success. And then now, once you have that, then you can obviously go get some investment to scale that, or you can reinvest all your profits to kind of scale that. So then you have scale. So if you're repeatable, predictable, scalable, and the last thing is to create sustainable is this is the part that usually companies today, if they're not, if they're, if they want to be exponential, sustainable is like creating this bureaucracy that kind of holds a company where it is. And what we've realized is, um, and I invented another term in them, I like to invent words. Um, but the idea of uh, sustainability is a great idea. But for companies today, they have to actually go beyond that instead of just survivability or maintainability or sustainability. I, I've gone further in that and say thriveability is the idea that you're thinking about all the different shareholders in the ecosystem, but you're actually thriving because you're doing that. And that's really where exponential theory is this idea that you create conscious you know, leaders, because you start thinking bigger, when you start thinking about more than just your tribe or people that look like you or people that are, you know, in your part of the world, 
you start to have this exponential thinking. And I think the biggest learning I had was going to Tel Aviv in uh, Israel and, you know, really seeing this uh, entrepreneurship, you know, literally juggernaut just at work. You know, you realize that these people have all their borders are surrounded with people with guns or that don't like them and don't want to wipe them off the face of the earth. And, you know, I don't want, this isn't a political conversation as much as it gives the ideology of Israeli entrepreneurs, why they've been so successful is they're now focused on the world. They're, they're automatically thinking about the world because one, their market's not big enough to make enough money to be satisfactory. So they're like, I've got to go to the Americas, to Asia, to Europe, you know, to Africa. And that's where they're exporting technology and thinking about the world. And it's why they've created this ecosystem to kind of disrupt so many different areas because they automatically are forced to think bigger about what they do. And that doesn't translate always when you're working in a big company and you're comfortable. You know, it's actually a lot of risk averse people saying, I don't want to make decisions because making a decision. So that idea of thriveability is the idea that if you're going to be around longer than 10 more years, you're going to have to reinvent your business model, whatever size of company you are. And that, you know, it's true right now. Apple's in a massive, even though they have more cash than everyone in the S&P 500 and actually, you know, as a big company to kind of look at, they're reinventing their business model to create a subscription model of their iPhones, eventually potentially voice over IP that they disrupt the telecommunications market, obviously rumors of cars, all kinds of, you know, health gadgets. Like the idea is they know they have to reinvent their model. They can't stay, you know, with their bread and butter forever. And that's what they've done very well is, time the market, which I talk about that in the book is just the timing of making sure that you're bringing innovation. Cause many of my companies failed because I was, I saw the trend that was going to happen and I was just there too soon. Like I, I created a video job board in 2004. Well, YouTube didn't start to 2006. So um, I was like, you know, the better way to get a job is to see a video about every company. Well, we ended up, you know, getting a, a lot of companies on board, ended up having about 3,500 clients and that fell off the cliff when um, in 2008, when the mortgage crisis and nobody wanted jobs, it was a luxury to have a job board. But the, the idea was really just too early where now video has been integrated into every job board and kind of part of the norm. But that's to say is I learned something there and I was able to apply that to the next startup and it allowed me to be successful and, you know, invest my money into the next thing and the next thing. And that all led me down this path to facilitation where I got really interested after meeting all these exponential leaders that they just had, they just thought differently. They didn't, you know, they didn't have this thinking of this is good enough. You know, it was always like, how can we, you know, push it, you know, just this much more and um, cover a lot of that in the book because the, you know, the book really is 15 years of my life, my, you know, blood, sweat and tears into this book that, uh, you know, I, I, COVID was really a blessing for me because it allowed me to focus and finish the book um, where I was always on the road. Well, obviously I got taken off the road um, and was able to kind of finish that. But um, it, it led to this kind of theory that um, is very applicable to, to every person starting in their garage. Um, one, to raise venture capital or any of these things is you have to create a hockey stick curve or whatever you want to say. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of that is, you know, creating something that is repeatable, predictable, scalable, and sustainable. And then I'll say thriveable right. after that. <laughs> Let's um let's bring come back down for one second just to want to catch up people that are listening that are like, hey, this is great. I mean, you're giving these great examples. Who doesn't want to be like Elon Musk or like Apple? I love that. Apple and a lot of arguments <laughs> sustaining the S P five hundred by themselves. <laughs> um what is your definition of exponential thinking? Yeah. So, you know, part of it is leaving the linear thinking that we often have chronological is to say, I have to do this, then this, then this, you know, part of it is accelerating. I, I think a good way to look at it is um, I used to actually say change is the only constant um, in the book. I actually say, say it's actually, it's not constant. It's actually accelerating. And I think that's part of where every company needs to be at, where they need to learn inside their industry uh, in the, industries around them. And that's where no longer can you just think about your competitor. You need to think about how would you outgrow like your industry. And I think those are the, the ability to think bigger than, you know, someone is what's in front of you. And it, it takes a little while to, for people to wrap their head around that because we're so trained to think cause and effect where, you know, what you want to see in exponential thinking 
and really create an exponential minds. And I, I call it the XMBA, which is a program that I work with. Um, and, and some of my coaching is exponential mindset, beliefs and attitudes is that there is a structure that if you look at people that think big and that have made a lot of change in the world, they all started small. And that's where the book, you know, I think for your, for your listeners, um, you know, the book, you know, Google was going to sell to excite for a million dollars because they didn't see that they had a business model. Um, this is back in the nineties, you know, before they actually really, they had already taken off a little bit, but they were like, well, we just want to be, you know, we want to be PhDs and this running a business is too much, you know, excited by us for a million dollars. You know, even, you know, Elon Musk in 2018 really wanted to sell Tesla, you know what I mean? So there's all these stories of all these different people that at one time or another had doubts or fears or anxiety or worries or stresses about their business. And part of the XMBA is to get where you start to clear up that fear, which I consider is false evidence appearing real. And your own belief in the product, you know, is, is going to go a long, long way. And I think that's going to make the extra phone call. And when I think of working with entrepreneurs, when people can wrap their head around a purpose that is much larger than themselves, they start attracting the right talent to get the right sales leaders, to get the right marketing people. Um, and you look at all these companies that really have, you know, done it exponentially. It's because they've attracted the people around them to kind of, you know, manage the different components to really grow that. And as every entrepreneur, there comes a point where you need to make your first hire. And I mean, I'll start there. That probably is relevant to a lot of your listeners. Um, you know, part of that is how are you going to talk about yourself and how are you going to talk about the company you're going to be? And how do you, you know, I even say, you know, I used to build a lot of websites with a digital strategy company and I'd say, well, build the website that makes you look like the company you want to be, not the company you are. And that's part of really just creating the belief system for, you know, your employees, your supply chain, your customers, your partners. And that's, you know, I create another rule in the book called the rhodium rule, which I'm sure you're all familiar with the golden rule, which is to treat others as you would want to be treated. And then there's the platinum rule, which I think is more applicable today is treat others as they would want to be treated. And rhodium is a material that is actually the most expensive metal. It has platinum in them. So I, I kind of took this idea of creating a, a new rule, rhodium rule, is think about the entire ecosystem. And I think the earlier that people can do that uh, in today's culture and climate of social media, it's going to allow them to grow much, much, much quicker is to understand the impact of their product on all the different shareholders, whether it's, you know, and this goes to sustainability, it really goes to this idea of thrivability and, and Mars shots is, you know, how do we help people expand their own mindset? But when they're talking to raise capital or get an employee or a key hire, you know, it's actually painting that picture of where you're going to be. And I think part of that is all these companies that are great examples that now, you know, we can look back and say, oh, wow, look at how they did it. Um, we can also talk about the failures of, of where people got sidetracked and didn't continue to focus and pivot on their real massive transformative purpose. And in the book, I cover Yahoo and Blockbuster and, you know, all these different companies that that literally because their own ego and own thing were kind of passed by very, very quickly. But it really goes down to the the, the solo entrepreneur, which I've I've been that person many, many times over and over again is the belief in what you're doing and finding a passion and purpose. And if you don't have that for whatever you're doing, you're, you're likely to not make it, if that makes sense. Like it really is the ingredient. And don't worry about sharing your idea with anyone else and them stealing it. If you have the passion and purpose, you're going to move faster than them and more diligently and things are going to work out. And that's, that's how I've always coached like entrepreneurs to kind of begin on this, you know, linear because an exponential mindset literally starts off and there's in the book, there's Peter Diamantis and Stephen Kotler created something called the six D's of a disruption and starts off as once something gets digital or digitized, it becomes deceptive for a long time. It's just moving along and, you know, people aren't really noticing that. And that's, you know, we, you know, we'll use some of these different companies that went exponential. Then they get to a point where they become disruptive and then they literally go to dematerialize, demonetize and democratize. And, that's where you see these exponential companies is to understand and have a vision of how you're going to do that for your industry or for several industries um, starts to one, make you sound a little crazy. But the reality is if you can handle the critics and just be independent of, you know, how you believe in your product, you know, over time, people will start believing in some crazy things. And mm -hmm. I've got a lot of examples in the book of different entrepreneurs that when they start off, I mean, their ideas just, 
you know, sound stupid and, you know, they don't sound like they're, you know, they're literally crazy from what everyone else is doing. But oftentimes innovation comes from actually doing something that's not like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And the world is abundant enough. And with the marketplaces that we have, as we're tapped into all these different networks, um, we're able to kind of take whatever our passion is and make it our purpose. And I think that's, you know, even when I teach my 14 year old daughter, who is a patent holder and an entrepreneur herself, um, you know, it's just, you know, whatever you want to do, you can make a market out of it as much as it sounds strange. I used to not believe that. Um, but my ex-wife, I helped her become the crockpot girl. And I never knew there was going to be a business out of doing crockpot recipes. But now 10 books later, a couple million followers. Um, she's the queen of crockpots and, you know, mm -hmm. sells products online and is an influencer in that space. And that all came from really her belief is that this is what I like to do. And so she liked putting recipes together and exploring. So for a long time, I was much heavier uh, because we always had 10 <laughs> crock pots with food with them. So you got to watch your hobbies that they fit into your other goals in your life. But uh, the bottom line is that any, pa any passion that someone has, um, they can follow that uh, work exponentially to, to see where it goes. And we're starting to see it more and more every day with, with different people, with the, just the platforms. I mean, there's no better time in the world where you have a, you know, equal opportunity to kind of go create a business. And uh, it's just an exciting time. And if you think exponential, then you can really start to create an impact very quickly because you just got to get it. Really, I always say is the first thousand people, the thousand true followers, I'm not sure if or thousand true fans is, um, kind of a mental model, but once you get a thousand true fans, they will perpetuate your business and refer and grow it. And, you know, that with social media has never been easier to do than today. I love that you were the recipe tester. That's just good. good so good. Um, I've so got go a lot of crockpot food. In yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, so the idea of exponential thinking, thinking bigger, thinking outside of the box, being aware of the entire ecosystem, but getting a little bit more granular, like how can somebody just get started on that? Because oftentimes people have difficulty in seeing the big picture because they don't understand it yet or they haven't experienced other people thinking that way. So number one, is there any, any places they can look, research, obviously the book, or practices that they could do daily to begin to think bigger and then to be able to maintain that way of thinking? Well, the book is, I always look at things is, is I used to run the National Association of Sales Professionals. So I learned a lot about, I went through every sales training there is. And really you just ask, you connect with people, you ask questions and you close whatever sales process that it is. It's, it boils down to that. And, you know, there's lots of techniques and, and different things, but at the end of the day is, is you got to get that to where it's repeatable. And so whatever you're selling or whatever your product is, um, it may not be exponential today. It may be very linear. But and that's that deceptive phase of how do you grow it exponentially is the belief that you can grow it and actually to think longer term about your product. Um, I have this idea that I, I you know, I've, I've shared is to create one million exponential leaders through this book. And, you know, I've, I've worked with the other leaders that have wrote an exponential books, uh, Peter Diamantes and Salim Ishmael, who wrote exponential organizations. Um, I was entrepreneur in residence at Singular University, and I saw a lot of exponential companies and and really focused on this model of being repeatable. Whatever the idea, however small it seems, is one to get it repeatable so that you can do it over and over again. And then it starts to scale already when you can actually prove and your sales gets better, your marketing gets better, your message gets better. So step one is really just making something very repeatable. And, I, and this is kind of reiterating that model that I shared before. At a certain point, you can start to create some systems that make it very predictable. Meaning that like, hey, if we reach out to a thousand customers, we know that we'll create two new customers this month. And I mean, that's that's probably not a very good, uh, I call them buyer funnels because everyone's buying, you're not selling anything to anyone. Um, if you get caught selling, you already lost this kind of frees people from this idea that sales is a bad language. At the end of the day, there's too much information out there for you to sell anyone. You just have to connect with people, ask questions and then close. But in this buyer funnel is helping people kind of work through it so that it becomes predictable. Then when you scale it is, okay, now I can reinvest money at a scalable rate. Then you can buy Facebook ads and Google ads and do some of these things to really scale and compete your business. Then you can participate in things. But I think as a solo entrepreneur starting off, you know, most of your listeners is really figuring out what are you most passionate about? What are you most curious about was maybe the first thing. 
is helping people to really identify like all the things they're curious about. What could they be passionate about that they could find this purpose? And then the idea of this purpose is to make it a massive transformative purpose. Then you start thinking bigger of what is the potential of this idea. And you got to get that, you know, in your own head to kind of start thinking bigger about it. But then there's there's two more things that are intrinsic motivators that uh, psychologists have kind of found that really help people scale their ideas. And it's the idea of autonomy is that I'll create freedom by doing this through mastery of something. Like when you become an expert and I, I like what you said, I don't like to call anybody. I like how you introduce the show. I'm I'm not much. I, I really feel the more that I've learned about something, the more I know that I don't know anything about it, if that makes sense. So the world that claims, self-proclaims there's a lot of experts. Um, I'm deep on the rabbit hole on exponential thinking and psychology and neuroscience and behavioral science, all these things of what makes people, you know, really think bigger and, and get off their linear life and get into an exponential life, which then has the promise and perils of, you know, all the things that we think are the, the external motivators of, you know, owning things and driving things and having the spouse of your dreams or whatever it is. All those things are, you know, the nice to haves. But the reality of being an entrepreneur, if you're not passionate and purposeful about your idea, all those things will elude you because at the end of the day, it's not about the money. It's not about, it's about making the impact. In fact, almost every one of my exponential leaders, even though many of them are billionaires and some of them on their way to being trillionaires, um, you know, that I talk about in the book and even the ones that, that are, that I work with, you know, part of it is getting into their mindset is they never really did it initially for the money. In fact, Elon Musk, you know, I'll use him as an example again. He sold PayPal for $180 million dollars. And literally the next day he couldn't pay rent. And this is something for people to wrap their heads around to just see how an exponential thinker is. He put money into Solar City, Tesla and SpaceX the next day and literally did not leave any money to, you know, he's like, I'm just investing these three ideas. There are three exponential ideas. Maybe one of them will work. Maybe none of them will work, but I'm just going for it. And that, you know, is is really also part of his is be willing to fail at all costs. You know, I mean, I think that's part of the dangers and, 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 you know, the excitement of life. You know, we always want to get behind the character that really has nothing and is fighting all the other hero in the journey. Um, you know, and that's where entrepreneurs, if you're telling your story and your back's against the wall, um, we love those stories and we want to get behind those. And you see it when you see a good Kickstarter, at, you know, campaign, or when you see an entrepreneur getting out there to start a business because, they want to solve a problem for themselves or, you know, for a health reason or, or whatever it is, um, you start to see like, you know, you can create that story. And I think the biggest thing that, you know, if I could share with entrepreneurs about what are the, all these exponential leaders have done is they've created their exponential leader journey where they've told this story that people started to believe in them and then believe in the idea. And at the end of the day, we, we believe in people personally then we believe in them professionally and finally organizationally. That's also how we should have them buy, you know, is we have to solve the problem for the person first, then the professional, then the organization. Oftentimes sales go right, you know, we're going to solve this problem for your company. Well, if you haven't gotten into the intrinsic motivators of somebody, and I think that's what we really see when, you know, Steve Jobs walks onto a stage and says, I'm going to solve your problems with this iPhone, or I'm going to solve your problems with this Tesla. You know, all of a sudden the desire for these products and services are no longer like they even go to the background by wearing black shirts and you know Steve Jobs like is is how a waiter blends into the background of a nice restaurant. All of a sudden, their ego is set aside because they're so proud of what they've created. Mm -hmm. But that pride is is really out of the fact that they they're living out their purpose and and every day is this massive dopamine hit to just understand that they have a lot of validation that their products accelerating. And that's the exciting part of being an entrepreneur is. I, you know, for much as I said, you know, I, I failed at all these different companies, I really enjoyed it. I don't know how to say that, but, you know, enjoying the entrepreneurial process of learning and making mistakes is not to make those mistakes again. I mean, I think that's another part of exponential people in the growth mindset is they don't really get down about making mistakes or huge setbacks. Like what some people would say are huge setbacks are actually the fuel for these people with the mindset that have gone exponential. And that's where I've, you know, even myself, you know, my own learning and I've seen myself grow just by writing a book as a self-fulfilling prophecy that, and, and that was part of me writing this book is like, well, I'm going to write myself to be exponential and I'm going to work at it. And I, you know, it took me a long time to get there, but that then is now got me into being on the board of, 
you know, a company like Graphene X, which is this shirt I'm wearing that, you know, is, is an exponential growing. Every Kickstarter they have is just goes exponential. Um, the things that I get involved with now have exponential technologies in them, which I talk about. I have a chapter in the, the book that talks about these 38 exponential technologies that are coming to the world right now that will disrupt everything. And, you know, the next 10 years will create more wealth than we've created in the last hundred. Um, <clears throat> there's just so many opportunities uh, as the world moves from a linear, you know, a linear world to an exponential world. Um, there's going to be a lot of disruption in that. And I, I talk about that. Um, and that means that there's a lot of losers, but those that actually go to the growth mindset that bounce back quickly, that eventually get to a mindset where they can think bigger about their ideas, will start winning at a bigger rate. And there's an abundant world right now because we have just this huge marketplace that's never been tapped. And I, and I, and I say it like places like Africa are, are coming to a place where they want the services that have been other places. You know, Asia, we're seeing that. I mean, that's where my own journey of traveling and it's why I have oops, wrong side why I have the map on the, the back of the wall is you know I've been to many of those countries and they're all have opportunities to have the same thing come to their world and that's where we're seeing these exponential companies that have a roadmap and you know China as a country itself has has really taken the roadmap of all these other exponential companies and built those exponential companies within their borders they just happen to have you know, four times the people. So they actually go more exponential and they've created a, you know, really a market economy out of a economy that wasn't that friendly um, by basically taking all these ideas and making them their own. And I think that's part of innovation is there really isn't that much innovation out there. It's just actually doing the same thing, maybe a little better and a little differently. And again, getting to that repeatable, repeatable, predictable, scalable, sustainable model. I mean, that's, that I, I go back to that again and again because for for small entrepreneurs, if if they can do those four things, then they can raise as much money as they want and they will sell, they will get as many customers as possible because all of a sudden they've created their mindset, belief, and attitude to to really their company. And that translates to to adding the energy and the people behind that that gives them that exponential growth. I love it. Those four things. That's my takeaway. Repeatable, predictable. Scalable, sustainable, and thrivable. So yeah, five right. things. I actually learned. We don't something. have to think about that yet. That's that's <laughs> down the line. That's where you're trying to go. I love right. it. That's where you want to be, but let's let's leave that one off because that's what I. The big companies, I've got to teach them to be thrivable because they're they get in their own way to make the changes they need to make because they're like, well, we're already good enough. You know. Right. Right. Well, I hope nobody gets in their own way today. I think that um, everybody's going to be extremely. Um, fulfilled on this episode. I, I imagine we're going to get tons of feedback, comments, messages. Um, I want to direct everybody once again, if you want more of Aaron, um, pick up a copy of the book, Exponential yes. Theory. It's available everywhere where you buy your books. Amazing um, endorsements from some amazing people in the entrepreneurship space. Um, and also Aaron Bear, www.aaronbare.com. That's how you can connect with him. Aaron, thank you so much for being on this episode, for sharing your knowledge. I mean, I hope that we've encouraged a lot of people to really think bigger, to think exponential, as we always say, so that they can reach even more people, make an even bigger impact than ultimately, as you have done with selling 12 companies and all mm -hmm. of your success, to create the lifestyle that they deserve. We have to fuel um, the lifestyle so that we can continue to make a, a big impact in the world. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. We super appreciate your time. I hope that everybody will pick up a copy of the book. Thank you. All right, everybody. That's it for this episode of the None of Your Business podcast. Of course, Lacey and I will be back again next week with a brand new episode, um, sharing more tips for you so you can reach even more people, make an even bigger impact and create the lifestyle that you deserve. 